Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Leslie Hennan. I am the Entertainment and News Media Associate at Respectability. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and a visual description. I am a white woman with long brown hair. I'm currently wearing a black t-shirt from Brick. Uh, it says representation matters. And I have a virtual background behind me with the Respectability logo in yellow and white. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm also a writer and an alumni of Respectability's Lab for Entertainment Professionals with Disabilities. Uh, now that I'm working on staff at Respectability, I have the opportunity to help shape um, a lot of the programming of our labs and meet other disabled creatives, uh, just like the folks that we have on our panel here today. Um, a couple quick housekeeping things. Um, if you'd like to view the ASL interpreter in a larger screen, we invite you to just pin their video, which will spotlight the video throughout the entire panel. We also have live captioning that is available in this Zoom. Uh, you can uh, view those captions by clicking the CC bottom at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, or you can also click the link that uh, my colleague Isabella has just posted in the chat. Thank you, Isabella. And we will be taking questions during the second half of this panel. So you can feel free to add your questions into the Q&A box, also at the bottom of the Zoom toolbox um, at any point throughout the panel, and we'll be getting to them uh, in about the last 15 minutes or so. Um, okay, so today we have a bunch of really great uh, lab alumni from Respectability um, here to talk with us on the panel, um, and I'm going to have each of them kind of come on camera and introduce themselves. I'm going to just go down my screen. So first we have Sam Kraus. Do you want to come on and just give us a brief intro um, about who you are? Hi there. Um, my name is Sam Kraus. I am a television writer. Um, my visual description I'm a white man in a power wheelchair. I've got hazel eyes, brown hair, and I'm sitting in a green room. It's my bedroom. Um, and I also am an alumni, our alumnus of Respectability's uh, Entertainment Lab, and also a current entertainment apprentice. So I'm really happy to be here. Yay, thanks for being here, Sam. Uh, now let's go to Miles Hunt. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Miles Hunt. Um, a visual description, I'm a Caucasian male with gold glasses, brown curly hair, and a yellow shirt. Um, and I am a visual artist based out of uh, Ridgewood, New York, and uh, alumnus of the Ball Children's Content Lab, and uh, very happy to be here. Yes, very happy you're here. Okay, and let's go to Jeremy Singh. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a Taiwanese-American male with uh, black hair, black glasses, and a black hoodie, so everything black. I um, am a humanistic sci-fi TV writer, and I am also currently the Respectability Entertainment News and Media Apprentice, and I was also lucky enough over the summer to be part of the Respectability Entertainment Lab. Yay, thank you all for being here. Super excited to dive into this conversation. Um, and today we're just gonna chat a little bit about you know, breaking in to the entertainment industry um, and building a community with you know, other disabled creative professionals just like ourselves. That's, that's my dog. Uh, she loves to uh, make an appearance whenever I'm doing live events. <laughs> Um, so you might hear her throughout this as well. Um, but let's just start out with um, a question. So you all participated in some of Respectability's pipeline programming. I myself also did the entertainment lab um, in summer of 2020. Um, so let's talk a little bit maybe, you know, how, how all of you kind of got started on this path to the entertainment industry um, and how that led you to Respectability. Whoever wants to go first or I, I can call on people. <laughs> I can go first. Um, I, um, I, in, in terms of like how I decided to be a writer, a television writer, um, I, I think I always loved entertainment. I loved um, movies, television, so very typical things. But I, it, I think the genesis of my love for entertainment came from my disability, in particular, um, entertainment or television and, and movies felt incredibly accessible. And so when I started like performing and and doing theater and then yeah, um, and doing all sorts of things, just acting, singing, 
music and writing, it just felt like I was not really limited um, by the inaccessibility of the world. I could actually um, do something fun and cool. And so I think I was like around the age of 17, I reached out to my a friend, her name's Lauren, and she's a television writer and she had a show called Awkward. And um, And I decided, I don't know why at 17, that I was just going to be friends and and make a connection and 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 learn from Lauren and uh, through the years she's been a mentor and just the best um, human being on planet Earth and um, years I think I was in undergrad she invited me into one of her writers rooms just to to visit and I sat in that room. It was for On My Block and it's on Netflix. It's a great show. And it was the fr first couple of weeks that they had been in the room. And I sat and watched everyone pitch their stories. Um, and I just sort of knew right away that that's what I wanted to do too. And, uh, and so then I started taking meaningful steps towards becoming a television writer. Um, going to grad school, doing the labs. Um, I found respectability by following other disabled television writers who posted about it. And I believe on Instagram. So anyway, that's that's my, my long story, but that's how I, you know, decided to enter the world of entertainment. So I love that. Um, yeah, what a cool experience also to have that opportunity to uh, kind of sit in on a writer's room when you're like, I remember when I first learned like what a writer's room was, <laughs> I had a similar reaction of like, oh, this is what I want to do all day. <laughs> oh my God. I know it was just like, oh my God, Leslie, it was just the best. And I talk about it all the time and it, you know, it gave me a lot of um, opportunities later on. And I can talk about that later, but it's just, I, you know, I, I made a friend and that friend was nice enough to, you know, let me see her world. And she's, you know, just the best. So, so yeah. I love that. We'll get, we're going to talk about making friends a little bit in the next question. So we'll circle back <laughs> to that. Um, but let's go over to Jeremy. Yeah, my uh, pursuit of a career in entertainment was when ever since I was little, I've always loved writing and um just like human interaction, how people communicate with each other. I initially thought my path would be more towards journalism and that's what I devoted most of my uh, high school education towards. But once I went to college, I made the pivot to psychology and I was planning on becoming an art therapist. Um, and then once the pandemic happened, I realized that I wanted to, really tell my own stories and help other people and storytelling allows me to do both of those and also allows me to explore my curiosity of like human interaction the psychology of characters stuff like that so I started applying a lot of internships and then I was lucky enough to be an intern at the Center for Scholars and Storytellers um, in which uh, Yalda was actually uh, one of like the presenters yesterday, day one, talking about all the data that the Center for Scholars and Storytellers is doing. And they did a collaboration with Respectability. I think it was with Tatiana Lee, who um, it was like through Clubhouse. So that's where Respectability was on my radar. And then I leveraged my internship at CSS to become a diversity, equity, and inclusion intern at Warner Discovery, which is led by um, Karen Horn, who was a moderator in another panel yesterday at Brick Summit. And they had an early career boot camp where I got to hear about what everything respectability stands for. And that's when I knew that I wanted to be part of it. 
Amazing. Thank you so much for that. And I love how already we have two totally different ways of kind of breaking in, um, uh, but also like similar themes. I think that's important to recognize, like there is no one way to break into this industry. Like everyone has a totally different journey and they're all totally valid. Um, but let's go over to Miles. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so my, my foray into the entertainment industry was through my, uh, I'm hearing impaired, and uh, I have my AirPods in now, but when I was younger, I learned how to lip read and uh, communicate that way. And part of that involved uh, speech therapy. And everyone was learning their syllables by clapping their hands like this. But for me, I started doing it like this, like, a, a, just I don't know, just click that way. I call these guys the guys and it just became a thing. And then right off the bat, you know, who 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 were the best people to do the syllables with? Sesame Street and the Muppets. You know, I became obsessed. I wanted to be involved in that world. I felt so represented in that world. A, a bunch of cool, diverse, different, accepting people. And I was like, I have to go there. It was a linear focus. I have to be a part of that. I have to get in. And then in college, I, you know, I lucked out by getting an internship for two summers with the Jim Henson Company. Got to, you know, go on Sesame Street, you know, be immersed in that creative atmosphere. And I was just like, this is the world I want to live in. But how can I take it a step further? And since then, my, my uh, prerogative has been to make a animated series in the same vein of a Sesame Street feel. You know, everyone's included, everyone's accepted, everyone's, you know, part of this, you know, group who are just striving to, you know, make something great. And so that's what I've been doing. And that's and part of my uh, journey through there is I reached out to Respectability a couple of years ago for advice. And at the time, I think it was just, you know, it wasn't perfect timing. It, either everything, too much was going on, too much was, you know, on everyone's plate. And then the lab popped up on my feed and I applied on a whim, like, oh, this could be fun. And it ended up being, like, I got in and it ended up being a wonderful time. And, um, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> Yay. Yes, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Let's go back to um, kind of the idea of networking. Um, it's a, I feel like it's a very loaded word. Um, people say it a lot in this industry. Um, I always prefer to think of networking as just making friends, <laughs> right? Because I think it takes a little bit of the pressure, for, um, at least for me, off of like, oh, I have to make this very important professional uh, connection with this person and my career depends on it. Where really, I feel like, you know, in entertainment specifically, um, oftentimes the jobs that we're working, you spend a lot of time with this, the same group of people. So you, it's uh, kind of a combination of like, you know, being really talented, working really hard, and then also like finding the, the, your, your group of people that you want to keep working with over and over again. Um, so do any of you have kind of some other tips for networking, how to make it feel a little less uh, intimidating or overwhelming, especially when you're first kind of starting to break in? Uh, miles. Um, I think the thing that worked out the, the best in my experience has been not to close yourself off to people who may not necessarily be in your field. Uh, I've talked with so many, you know, people all the way from, you know, uh, you know, corporate life to purely artistic world to, you know, you know, science the science driven educational driven but somehow all these things kind of intertwine in some way and you never know when someone years later say oh i remember you you were you were the guy talking about the muppet so cool i got the, my friend doing this thing i don't know how you could be connected to it but give him a chance and i mean that's how i even got my internship with uh, the jim henson company it was a, a friend of mine friend who was a children's book author he's like oh i know this person on sesame street here let me put you two and two together and i mean just just never know and i I think you just have to, you know, be vocal about what you're trying to do in this space because it's interesting. People want to learn more about it, um, and it's a great conversation starter. And it really, and it, everyone has a great story, and it sticks in your mind. And you, you never know where that could lead. So talk to everybody if you can. Yeah, so true. And I think that um, I want to highlight what you said about you know, really being vocal about what you, it is you want to do, you know, whatever um, that might be, just continually putting it out into the universe and also other people around you will pick up on that. And in my experience, people in the industry do really want to help each other out and like help each other kind of 
climb that ladder because we've all climbed that ladder in different ways. Um, in my experience, at least that's been, um, definitely something I didn't expect coming in, but yeah, you never know where one uh, connection might lead you. Um, but Sam or Jeremy, do you have any, uh, any tips or some, like, uh, we've kind of, kind of dived into the next question a little bit already, but any like stories of, you know, this unexpected connection led you to something, uh, totally, you, just, you never know where your next kind of job or connection is going to come from. Um, I was going to say, uh, every, by the way, my, everything that Miles and Leslie said, absolutely. Um, um, I, I think I'm trying to think of a great, um, I reached out to a, a showrunner, um, I'm a gay man and um, and I decided, all right, you're gay, you're disabled, you're all of these things. It'd be kind of fabulous to get to know writers, TV writers who are also a part of the same communities. And so I reached out to a showrunner um, and she did a Queer as Folk, a couple other things. Um, but I just like said, hi, I would love to connect. I said, I'm a queer writer. I'm a baby writer. I'm an, emer an emerging writer. And I just want to connect. Um, and she was lovely. And so we talked, you know, briefly back and forth just through IG, Instagram. Um, but literally, I think a year later, because of that brief correspondence, I was able to invite her to like come hang out with me and my writers group. Um, for like 50 minutes and she just sat with us and talked with us and you know there's five of us and it was just from me connecting with someone that I had something a little bit in common with um, and yeah so that's like my story and I I think also knowing like where to find people so so like I think the greatest thing you can do is make a list, watch all the shows you love, then check out the credits of the show, uh, target sort of the the writers that you just love. Maybe they wrote an episode you're just obsessed with. And then uh, you can look them up on IG, uh, Twitter, anything, LinkedIn. Um, and then just say, hi, I would love to just connect. And they're not like, they're not going to be like, ew, get away. And most of the time, in fact, if you say, I would love to do like a Zoom coffee, or I would love to like, just learn a little bit from you. Um, they're going to be really excited to do that because secretly everyone wants to pass on knowledge and it's worked for me to do that. And I know um, also WGA's directory, writer's directory, it works. And so I can talk about that later, but it's just, there's all kinds of ways. So that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, that's great. I agree. I think this kind of era of, um, you know, the pandemic put everyone online and I think the virtual networking is here to stay. I think it's made networking so much more accessible for everyone. <laughs> it's so much easier to hop on a quick Zoom or a Google Meet, you know, than it is to like plan and schedule and coordinate a coffee like as much as I want to meet people in person it's so much easier for me to commit to like yeah let's uh here's a zoom link I'd love to talk for you know this from this time to this time um and I think that's something people can definitely take advantage of um is like reaching out and um just asking to chat and Sam I think that was how you and I first connected right was our scripts <laughs> are both had made it to the finalist stage of this contest and you had reached out and then yes. we we talked and then a few weeks later I was interviewing you for the lab and I was like wait <laughs> um so yeah I know. It, reach out to everyone, uh, definitely take advantage of the virtual networking, the social media. Um, that's a that's a great tip. Um, let's talk a little bit about some ways um, that the industry is changing and becoming more inclusive of people with disabilities. I mean, we all know we still have a long way to go, but I do think that we are starting to see at least, you know, more awareness of accessibility and like the importance of including disabled people in the room, hiring disabled people um, in all areas behind the camera, in front of the camera. 
um, you know, what are some things you've noticed or maybe some times that you've successfully advocated for yourself in the room? I know that's a big, a big thing that, you know, for me, I didn't grow up like knowing how to advocate for myself. So that's been kind of like a lifelong <laughs> journey of figuring out how to do that. And for me, it's been like watching other people advocate for themselves and learning like, oh, this is a thing that I could also ask for that could help me like um, my disability, I was born with club feet. So I, it's difficult for me to stand for really long periods of time. So if I'm ever on set, like I'll just ask for a spare Apple box to sit down. And that's a very simple thing for <laughs> a production to provide. Um, and I didn't even know that that was a thing I could ask for until I saw someone else do it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, any, any thoughts around that sort of big, <laughs> big question? <laughs> Uh, Miles, um, I think uh, I think the uh, representation and the uh, familiarity is definitely more prominent in 2023, and hopefully it will continue that way. Uh, I I think the big part is the more more people are due to the not only just due to the pandemic, but also due in, to virtual conversations. The people are more familiar. The the understanding the you know, empathizing a little bit more and it's not it's just it's not daunting to see it there i mean we see it in um the, the, the secret last lives of college girls uh, uh dakota which won the oscar last year which you know as a hard of hearing person with many deaf friends and uh you know part of that community it was so great to see that but there's, there's still some drawback in some places for example the the current show that i am pitching has a Deaf character as the lead. And a lot of the times when I talk to executives in the space, it's either half half understand what I'm going for, or the other half are going, oh, so you want this to be a completely deaf show, everybody's deaf, speaking ASL. And I'm like, that, that would be amazing and very cool. But no, it just he just happens to be a deaf musician with his friends who are whether hearing, but they also have diverse disabilities themselves or diversity and included, just like the real world is. And uh, it kind of goes over their head a little bit because they don't understand how they can make it work. And then I have to, I feel like I always have to go that, that extra mile to just put it in perspective for them, which I think is helpful for, for them, but also just for the creative standpoint. Like, it's just a story I want to tell how we're going to tell it accurately with, you know, uh, ASL with interpretation, lip reading, closed captioning. Or how, how is all that going to come into play, especially in an animated medium? Um, but I think the exciting thing is people are talking about it and they want to talk about it and they understand the value of it, about using it in an appropriate way. I think one show, uh, Secret Sex Lives of College Girls, they did it really well with that uh, many times. But I think there's also great programming where they talk about it, but it's not like the, um, it's not like hitting the nail on the head, so to speak. It's just, yep, there, there's a deaf guy there. That, that's it. It's not like, oh, we have to all put a lens right on him and learn everything about this deaf character. Oh, just, he's, just, he's just there being involved, just like we all are. And uh, it's getting better for sure. Of course, it's going to take, I don't even know how long it's going to take, but it's always going to be a constant improvement, but it's good to see it happening. Yeah, I agree. Um, Sam or Jeremy, do you have any, any thoughts on that question? You, you could go, Sam. You go. <laughs> oh, are, are you sure? <laughs> um, well, mine's very quick. I was just going to say there's a show because Miles is talking about some great representation. There's a show I'd, I ended up writing about for, uh, my EC for grad school and, it was called Everything's Gonna Be Okay, is by Josh Thomas, uh, who uh, actually through writing this show discovered that he was on the spectrum. Um, but in the show before he makes this discovery, which I think I just ruined the season arc for everyone. So sorry if you haven't watched it, damn it. Um, oh well, but the point is he writes really well. Um, he writes the characters very well and he incorporates a disability and queerness um, in such a fun way. Um, but yeah, that was, I'm seeing that on, on screen and or seeing stuff like that on screen is exciting. And I think 
it makes me certainly feel better when I have accommodations or things that I need to ask for because people are seeing more of me or people that look like me on screen. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just one of many reasons why that representation is so important is just to get the awareness and, you know, yeah, I, everything you said, <laughs> um, Jeremy, did you have something? Yeah. I mean, I would definitely want to give a shout out to Warner Discovery and that I always felt like I was in an inclusive and accessible space when I was able to be a production assistant on one of their shoots. They had a production accessibility coordinator, which is the first time I've ever seen that. And it taught me the importance of setting that tone on any set. So that's what I did when I directed my own short. When we started the day, I would just disclose to everyone my accessibility needs and let them know that if they have any that they could um, let me know about them. But I do think that uh, we do have a long way to go. I forgot who said it, but I remember someone said like uh, the disability community is like where the LGBTQ community is like 20 years ago. Like there's still a long way to go. And I mean, an example of that is I remember when I was trying to apply to a position and I remember someone giving me the advice that you shouldn't disclose you know that you have generalized anxiety and stuff like that because it could make them um, not necessarily consciously reject you but it makes them like scared to choose you over someone who is quote unquote like more easy to work with yeah no that's such a good point that some of that just unconscious bias definitely still exists um for all different types of identities and I think you know again the more we I loved how you shared about, you know, you share your own accommodation needs. Um, just kind of, I just feel the more like we keep talking about it, uh, the more everyone's just going to get more comfortable with, you know, their own kind of journeys <laughs> uh, and understanding of disability and accessibility. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, there's so many different uh, pipeline programs. We've all, we've talked about some of respectabilities. You've all mentioned others. Like there's so many different really great opportunities for um, emerging creatives to kind of break in or just start getting their work out there. Um, do you all have any uh, tips for kind of navigating that the application process, the this it can be a little daunting, I think, for people that, that are trying to break in or you know who choose to go the the contest or pipeline uh, route. But any any thoughts around that? I think that the number one thing uh, that matters, maybe even more than your work, is your your branding and your point of view. Um, in many ways, I feel like it's better to write an okay script that is saying something, you know, than, than like a retread of a story that we've all seen a million times. And that's really what these programs and contests are looking for. Um, a lot of times you are told to draw from your own lived experience so that you could have that unique perspective that makes you different from other applicants. Yeah, such a good point. And I think myself as someone who applies to a lot of programs and also is now in the position where I'm often interviewing people for these types of programs, I think I my biggest tip is to really just be as specific as possible about what it is you want to do, like just be true to yourself, like tell them what you want to do, like what is your point of view. I think it's really easy sometimes uh, to think like, you know, I, I want to, I just want to be in the room. I want to, I I'll do anything, like put me anywhere. Um, and I totally resonate with that, um, as well, but being on the other side, I've realized like, it's so much easier to like, you remember, uh, specific things that people tell you about themselves and specific things about their personal stories and journeys. And it just gives us on the other side, like a, an easier time to like, oh, I know exactly who to connect you with, like, you'd be a great fit for this project. And I'd love to, you know, it's a little, it just makes it easier for the 
for people, I think, to connect you or put you in like the specific uh, program that is going to be right for you. Um, but yeah, Sam or Miles, any any thoughts? I, I was going to say, um, absolutely. I think um, definitely. I I'm really not an expert at it at all, um, and so. And also, uh, I think with Leslie's, because I, I know you you review ap applications. Um, it's like an incredible way to sort of see um, what is out there, and 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 um, so I haven't had like the bird's eye view, but I do think I don't know, and Leslie can let me know, but I do think it's cool if you uh, submit consistently to the same one like over like um throughout the years because I I don't know if it's and respectability I I think that matters I don't know but um Leslie can tell you all that but but with other programs I think if you um apply one year and you don't get in but then you apply the next year or the next cycle for some reason I've gotten really lucky and I think that had something to do with it. So that's my one tip uh, is to apply to the same ones consistently. No, I think you're totally right. And I've heard from other um, folks that are on different, you know, um, review boards for different uh, programs and uh, people really do keep track of, you know, the work that you're submitting. And I, one thing that one takeaway that I've gotten from being on the other side of this process is so often it is it has no reflection whatsoever on you like or your work if you don't get into something it's such uh, a like a very specific process of picking you know the the right combination of people for this particular cohort because we really want to at least you know respectability I can speak towards us specifically we really want to make sure that we're building a cohort of people that are going to play off of each other's specific strengths and, you know, just learn a lot. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into it besides just, you know, the work and talent and experience. Like everyone, everyone that applies to our programs is so talented and it's often a very, very difficult decision uh, who who we end up picking. Um, but yeah, that's uh, all good points. Well, we can, that actually is a great segue into our next question, which is, you know, all of you have been a part of um, different respectability programs that we've offered. So I'd love to kind of go to each of you to share a little bit about your experience. You know, if folks are interested to, in applying, what can they expect? Um, let's go to Jeremy first, because you were in our um, in-person LA Entertainment Lab this past summer. Um, and then also now you're an apprentice with us. So you want to share just a little bit about the two programs and uh, what you kind of experienced in both of them? Yeah, I think what makes the lab at Respectability, the in-person lab specifically different from most is that it is through that lens of disability and teaching you how to advocate for yourself. And it also teaches you basically how to have that point of view and how to polish that personal branding so that you could be ready for the industry to get jobs. And I think the thing that allowed me to have a really great experience was that I just viewed it through the lens of learning. I feel like that's the number one thing that motivates me to get out of bed every day. So every day when I would go to an event, I would make sure to have done research on the panelists um, so that I could ask questions that aren't generic, that are very specific to that person. And then also always made a note to um, send thank you emails and stay in touch with all of them. And I feel like that was a huge reason why I was able to also get the entertainment media apprenticeship because I, even though I am like a, like a homebody introvert and I would much rather like just be in my room and just be a potato, I really use like my journalism and therapist background to make genuine connections with everyone in the lab. And yeah, I'm very lucky now to be um, one of the apprentices is at respectability, and I'm starting to get a behind the scenes look at like the admin work that we do on a daily basis. 
And I'm going to start working on some like consulting projects, which is really cool because then it'll allow me to have my stories be more inclusive as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. And then Sam, uh, you will participate in our virtual lab, which is kind of the same uh, version uh, that Jeremy described, but um, all online, which we, the lab originally started in 2019 as this, you know, uh, people would come to respectability saying, you know, oh, we'd love to hire a disabled writer or a disabled director, uh, you know, but we don't know any. And so <laughs> we now can turn around and say, you know, we have like over 150 very talented disabled people that are already working in the industry. So please hire them <laughs> um, and uh, that have all been through our programs. Um, and then we now have uh, in-person and a virtual um, cohort every year. So Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your experience in the virtual lab? Absolutely. Um, I when I did the interview for respectability, I with uh, first with Leslie, and then um, my last interview was with Lauren, who's the VP. Uh, she's the big boss, um, and so I, she's you know, the uh, you know she'll give you the thumbs up if you're I guess right for the program. Um, and she did ask me. She said virtual or in person. And I chose virtual because I just, I was about to graduate uh, college and the pandemic was, it's still here. And so I wasn't ready yet. Um, so anyway, so the virtual, you do a bunch of um, group sessions, you're meeting executives, you're meeting DEI, a um, folks who our experts at like um, accessibility and all the you know conversations around diversity, um, and they sort of give you uh, helpful tips um, for some of the programs that that they run the pipeline programs. I know there's a bunch of them <laughs> um, for like Disney, um, ABC, Warner Brothers. I, I I don't need to name them all, but um, so you you meet with those folks. Um, one thing that we learned that's stuck with me is because I'm a television writer. And so I needed structure on how to like make connections and just basic uh, business um, sort of terms. And so I, rem I remember uh, respectability invited a guest. Uh, DMA, and she's an executive. I think she used to be an exe executive at ABC or Disney, and she's fantastic. But she ran through sort of what you needed to know to be ready to like do meetings, and she defined a general, a staff staffing meeting, and a pitch meeting. And she said, as as a television writer, those are the three kinds of meetings that you're going to be doing. A general is typically, it's just a, a friendly like, hello, where it's like a catch up session. So maybe you've already met them, but there's no like overall business agenda. You're just saying hello. Staffing is exactly what it sounds like. It's when someone's looking to hire a writer. Um, and then pitching is when you're obviously pitching a story or pitching a series or pitching um, maybe there's a, an open writing project that they want to bring in a new writer for. Um, so learning stuff like that was incredibly valuable. And then a thousand other things, but, um, but yeah, so you're, you're getting a lot of knowledge within a six week, uh, program. It's a lot, but once you're done, you're ready, you know? So, so yeah, that was my experience. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And I, the, yeah, the goal of the entertainment labs is really to kind of get disabled creatives in front of people in hiring positions all across different areas of the industry to kind of help, um, you know, just put people in the position to kind of keep those conversations going and learn more about, you know, how they could get hired and um, kind of demystifying, hopefully, some of those things, like you mentioned, Sam, like the difference between a general meeting and a staffing meeting, or, you know, various different things uh, that we all have to navigate in this industry. 
Um, but Miles, you participated in our um, brand new lab in uh, this past fall, which was the Children's Content Lab sponsored by Netflix. Thank you, Netflix um, in New York. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, that experience? Yeah. Uh, first, it's, first off, it was simply amazing. Uh, it was, exceeded every one of my expectations going in. I really didn't know what the experience was going to be like, but it was just being thrown into a room of great contemporary creative writers and developers um, in the disability community or had a connection to disability in some form. It was just so refreshing and 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 just so nice. And we we got to go to different studios here in New York City and meet with different uh, industry folks and kind of learn about what's going on, where the direction of entertainment is going uh, in, in regards to a children's uh, audience. Um, and then we, did, we were able to do some virtual sessions and kind of uh, meet other people that way and workshop our own stories, which was really exciting because at the very end of the lab, we were able to present 10 minutes of each of our individual stories to a live audience of our peers and family and guests and really see uh, you know, the world we created in action. And it was just, uh, the, the, I mean, that that in itself was something so valuable that um, you really get as a creator, especially as a writer, to showcase it. You know, it was like a, um, a table read, but in, in an audience, uh, in an auditorium. And it was just wonderful. But I think the, the most rewarding bit was you were working with people who got it. They got what we were trying to bring to the table. They understood your story they understood your energy and you understood theirs and then they wanted to champion you every step of the way they wanted to edit they wanted to review things they offered their suggestions and i can't tell you my thing was my my initial draft for my showcase i had to i had no idea that so many people were going to be providing so much great insight and it turned into just that's a beautiful thing at the end and one of my one of the uh, lab fellows created a you know a plush character for, to showcase at the showcase and it was just she didn't have to do that and it was just above and beyond but it just it felt like people were in your corner and um now it's just we have a complete rapport we're giving each other insight to the day uh, and oh miles you should uh, you know you should apply to this this grant or would you mind taking a look at my script and it's just and that's that's what every creative wants you want to be involved you want to keep the involvement going and so it, it was just great and i think um everyone who can be involved in the future you, you'll love every second of it amazing i remember that um a uh, puppet that <laughs> was created for your show by another lab fellow which was incredible um, yeah, let's talk one last question before we head into our Q and A. Um, but Miles, you talked a little bit about you know that community um, with your other lab fellows, like you know continuing past the pipeline program, which I think is such an important aspect of like you know what happens after the the pipeline program. Um, how do you kind of continue building that community? Um, do you all have any tips for kind of you know staying in touch both with the lab fellows that you met and also like kind of leveraging the contacts of people you met, um, like industry folks in the lab. Um, it, it all can feel a little overwhelming. <laughs> I know, especially when you first, uh, like you're, you, it's done and now you're like, now what do I do? Um, do you have any any advice uh, uh, or tips there? Yeah, I, I think just uh, be honest and consistent. Uh, if you have a question, don't be afraid to ask it to your your colleagues and even the people who you met at these different studios. I, I have had so many, since the lab ended in the fall, I've had so many wonderful conversations with um, executives, other writers, producers, who we met at these uh, studios who just want to offer the two cents at a time. And uh, with the people in the lab at our cohorts, it's just, they, I think it's kind of like uh, the same way you would be about talking with your friends, you know, hey, I need your help with something or, you know, reiterating the fact that I'm here to help you too. You know, if you have a project you want advice on, if you have a project that you're conceptualizing but you don't know where to go, let's hop on a Zoom call. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. I don't care if it's, you know, a late after dinner thing that we're all signing into a Zoom, we're tired, we had a full day. We want to do it. We want to help each other out. And um I think you just keep the conversation, open a Slack channel, 
you know, exchange texts. And I, I, I know it sounds so simple, but it's, I know some people are very nervous about, oh, can I get your number? Or can I, you know, keep talking to you? Ask them and they'll be honest with you and just keep that conversation going. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I think um, one thing we like to do is, you know, have everyone kind of fill out a form of like how they prefer to be contacted. And we share that with um, the other lab fellows ahead of time. So, you know, like, okay, this person prefers email, this person prefers texts or phone calls, this person likes social media, and this person is open to anything. And I think that can be a really helpful way to, you know, kind of um, get over that first hurdle of like, oh, I, I want to co contact this person, but I don't know how to like keep that going. But so I, I think that's something that we can all maybe normalize in everyday life of like, oh, how do you prefer to be contacted? I think that's a nice way uh, to just kind of keep that going. Um, any other thoughts from Sam or Jeremy? Otherwise we'll jump into our, I already see lots of great questions in our Q&A box, so. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say it very quickly because yeah. I'm mindful of time. I think writers groups are really important. So if you can get, um, right now I'm in a writers group, there's five of us. We all, uh, Kim Menke from my lab, but also Miles, she did Miles's lab as well. Um, she sort of really organized it and it's five writers. We all love comedy. We're all, we all love TV. And so we meet once a month and we bring on guests um, to come, you know, hang out with us. And uh, I think that's really valuable. So, and it's all over Zoom. So. So it's like really easy. So writers groups are great. So that's yeah. my. I love that. Yeah, definitely use the Zoom. Uh, if you can find a Kim Mankey, <laughs> highly recommend. We love her. Everybody needs a Kim Mankey in their lives. Um, I agree. All right. So let's move over to some Q&A. Let me see. Um, let's see. I want to see if I can answer some of these quick ones. Um uh, what is the average age range of applicants to the summer lab? Great question. It really is a range. Like we have everyone from like early 20s all the way to people in their 50s and everyone in between. Um, it's hard for me to say the average because it does vary so greatly from cohort to cohort, but it's definitely everyone is there. <laughs> Uh, you know, sharing different uh, levels of experience. Many people are coming from uh, previous careers. Like I myself used to work in um, PR, public relations, and then I pivoted into writing. Um, and so there's lots of other people with similar backgrounds, regardless of their age, you know, have had multiple different um, careers or life experiences. Um, let's see, can you speak to the difference between the labs and apprenticeships? Yes, so the the labs are really for Folks who are looking to go into, um, you know, the entertainment industry, like working on set behind the camera or in like the studio system and development, um, you know, more of like the creative side of things. Um, and then our apprenticeships are, you know, we always welcome folks that are kind of looking to go into that area as well, but it's a little bit more about learning sort of the, the advocacy side of things that we do at respectability as well. And um, a little bit like you're kind of working on projects with our staff of like organizing some of our lab programs and reaching out to different speakers and um, organizing events like this one. And um, it's a little bit more of like the nonprofit uh, and advocacy side of things as well. Um, let's see. Um, da, da, da. I think those are the fast ones. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, this is a good question. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for sharing your perspectives and stories about disability representation. Uh, what are some examples and tropes you try to avoid when it comes to representing characters and themes in the disability community? Um, also, how do you deal with criticism when some aren't pleased with its execution and representation? Um, great question. Um, I can think of a lot of tropes we try to avoid, uh, but do any of you have thoughts and want to kick that one off? Uh, Miles. Uh I think uh, try to, if you're gonna tell a story with, I'm, I'm, I think that's across the board, not only in disability, but in you know, uh, any representation, if you're gonna tell that story and make sure you have accurate people involved who can assist with that. Um, make sure that, share it with those people. If you, if you are not of that and make sure the language is correct, 
make sure the discussion is ongoing and credit everybody involved and then make sure, you know, you can get there and I'm, I'm, get there as best you can. It's never going to be a hundred percent perfect. It never will be. There's always going to be some criticism, something you forgot, something that is new and developing. Um, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of deaf uh, creatives have issue. I, I wrote a paired children book with my proposed animated series around a deaf drummer just to showcase and give a visual representation of people so they could see what's going on. I had a lot of deaf people be very upset with how it wasn't all deaf people in a room or it wasn't the entire cast or characters weren't deaf. I, mean, I even had that an issue when I was growing up. A lot of, uh, since I wear hearing aids, there were a lot of people who criticized my parents for giving me hearing aids and not teaching, having me learn ASL. But, you know, I learned lip reading and had speech, speech therapy at the same way. So a lot of my stories are kind of in that realm. And I try to be, I try to defend what I'm telling to tell with that, those examples at place. But I am also welcome to the criticism and want to bring those people to the table too, so we can tell a more accurate story. So I think it's, you just have to listen. That's a pun. Listen. But you have to listen to what's going on. And I, I have to do that very well all the time, but really just, uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Nobody's going to get it 100% right. Just got to try your best and just be smart and, and know the right people to uh, bring on board. Yeah, all great. Uh, and we love to say, you know, the disability community is not a monolith and no community is. <laughs> um, we're, everyone's going to have different opinions uh, on representation and, you know, disability community is really the uh, the most intersectional, you know, anybody can be disabled regardless of your other identities. So really taking that into account of, you know, there's just so much nuance and variety in uh, the disability disability community. Um, such a good point. Um, but Sam or Jeremy, any thoughts on that question um, or any tropes that you try to avoid? I definitely try to avoid like uh, where people with disabilities are used for like inspirational moments or if they're vilified. And yeah, I feel like a lot of times the most important thing if you're portraying something that is not from your lived experience is to do the research and to talk to people with that experience. And that's the best way that you could show allyship and capture that authenticity. Yeah, great point. I definitely agree with all of that. So yes, all all great. Great question. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see. We have one person who is sharing that they um cannot get any accessibility on set. The um, you know, there's they're saying what they need, but it's just not happening. Um, I just want to call that out because I think totally valid, very frustrating <laughs> experience. And you know, it just speaks to how much more work does need to be done. Um, and I think this is a situation where, you know, respectability, we um, uh, we can, if you feel comfortable, you can send us an email. I'll drop my email in the chat or maybe Isabella can drop can drop it in. Um, if you're free to reach out, uh, we do a lot of um, just kind of trainings of like disability inclusion and um, accessibility on set and why it's so important. And, uh, you know, we would definitely love to kind of start that conversation and help kind of take the advocacy off of uh, some of the people that are, you know, having to both do their job and advocate for themselves, which can be um, a very exhausting experience. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's tough and, you know, just uh, if possible, just finding someone on set that you can talk to, whether it's, um, you know, a producer or a PA or someone that might be able to advocate, you know, why this is so important for you. Um, we also, there's, um, Jeremy, I think you mentioned the importance of having a production accessibility coordinator um, on set. That's a position that we really advocate for all, all productions, you know, from big major studio down to like very small indie productions. And it's just really having a person on set whose job is to make sure that everyone, uh, you know, disabled and non-disabled folks alike are having their accessibility needs met. Um, and so just really having one person who's dedicated to that. And of course that sort of, you know, the uh, having that person there is, uh, it's gonna be 
the job of the people that are in hiring positions. So that's where, you know, if we can uh, be pulled into those conversations, we definitely try to advocate and uh, connect them with production accessibility coordinators. Um, but yeah, that is an uh, excellent question. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, let's see, any other um, questions? I'm trying to go through. Um, mm, good question. So we have um, a deafblind screenwriter. Um, and, you know, how do you get past the, you know, we don't accept unsolicited queries wall. That's definitely a thing that, you know, new writers definitely run into. I know it is a very frustrating experience. Uh, and I also know from like the, on the studio side of things, often there are so many like legal reasons why they aren't able to accept unsolicited queries. Um, but I guess do any of you have um, tips or I know, Sam, I just want to call it your kind of writers group idea of I think that's a really great way to like, you know, you're not sending, you're not like just um, sending unsolicited queries to these showrunners or, um, you know, sending unsolicited scripts to everyone, but you're still kind of getting that FaceTime with execs. Do you want to talk a little bit about that a little more? I Absolutely. Um, that's a really great way for the person who asked that question um, is to set up those Zoom coffees or those, you know, if you can organize a writer's group, because sometimes when it's more than one person, it makes the other, uh, the executive or the advanced writer more excited to come visit and hang out with you. So that is actually, I would say the best way is to start off introductions first, maybe get a Zoom coffee um, with whoever, you know, maybe say, hey, I love this movie that you did. Um, and I just, I'm really interested in, you know, the kind of work that you all do. I would love to just grab a Zoom coffee if you got like 15 minutes. And they're not like, it's totally fine. Another thing to keep in mind is assistants are future executives. Like that is what they are. They're, they're basically executives. They're doing all of the reading. They're the ones that give the thumbs up if your script is bad or good because they have to put it on their boss's desk. So like reach out to some of those folks. LinkedIn every executive you could even conceive of is freaking on LinkedIn. Every assistant is as well. They list their names. So just send out some like, hey, I would love to like learn more, you know, Zoom copies and then do the group, the group copy thing, the, the writer's group thing, you know, just, and it's often, I would say, uh, we have Nathan Barney. He's director of current program at ABC. He's our mentor for our writers group. So get someone to be like the um, the sort of uh, person to oversee it. So there, it gives a little bit more legitimacy and, and they'll guide you a little bit. So you can ask like, you know, um, a more advanced writer to do that. So, or an executive that you might be, uh, connected to. So yeah, try that first. And then you can send scripts. Um, and it won't be a problem usually. That's a great, great tip. Um, I definitely want to call out the assistance thing again. And um, that's so important. Like, yeah, assistants are the ones that are reading the scripts or watching the reels um, and then pushing them up to their bosses saying, oh, I think we should meet with this person. I think we should work on this project. And I think that's, you know, so important. Sometimes, you know, you want to, well, I want to talk to the head of this department. I want to talk to the head of this, but so often um, it's really reaching out to more, the more junior employees um, that I, I have found to be a little more beneficial and they they often will have a little more time to meet with you as well. Um, the higher ups can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to get a hold of, busier schedules and everything. So um, definitely a great, uh, great tip there. 
Um, and I also want to call out that um, Isabella has posted um, a lot of great links in the chat. Um, don't forget to follow Brick, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Thank you so much to the Brick Foundation for having us and setting up this amazing two-day summit. We also, um, if you scroll a little further up, we have links to our Entertainment Lab applications, which will be opening for 2023 this upcoming Monday, February 13th. So definitely um, please head over there. We can't wait to see all of your applications and yeah that is now our time thank you so much to the everyone that was on this panel and to brick for having us this was so much fun um and yeah hope everyone had a good day